Hello and welcome once again to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. My name is Matthew Darlitz, Editor-in-Chief of the Science of Psychotherapy. And as always, I'm here with good mate Richard Hill. Hey, Matt, it's really good to be here. Good to see you. <clears throat> this is ter- th- this is terrific today. Uh, mm-hmm. This is one of my uh, list of people I want to talk to and have wanted to talk to for about a decade or more. So um, uh, tell people, who who have we got? Today, we're going to go and have a talk to Richard Schwartz. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, Richard Schwartz, he is the man uh, who created the internal family systems, um, which has been a paradigm, um, which has been very, very popular and very effective. And so we're very keen um, to have a chat to him. And he's going to be presenting at the Holistic Recovery Summit, uh, which is what we're promoting at the moment. And uh, he's speaking with a colleague as well who has uh, developed a lot of training material uh, along these lines. Uh, but Richard, uh, it's it's really great to be able to talk to Dr. Schwartz today. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, people have probably seen this IFS uh, as one of the sort of recommended therapies around the place. Probably seen it for a long time. Well, this is what it is. And it's, of course, it's appreciating, taking into frame, giving a context and a practical application of thinking in systems, which, of course, is a is a core to the stuff that we've been trying to tell people and which, of course, has uh, you know, got a major section in our book. So, uh, yeah, wow, let's let's go talk to uh, another Richard, uh, one who's done a lot more than me, but I'm really looking forward to talking to him. And before we jump across to talk to Dr. Schwartz, here's a quick message from the Weekend University about the summit that we'll be talking about in the interview. If you're interested in deepening your understanding of addiction and how best to treat it, you might want to check out the Holistic Recovery Summit. This is a free online conference which brings together 35 world-leading clinical psychologists, researchers and practitioners. We will share with you their best practices for mind, body, social and spiritual approaches to addiction treatment, enabling you to be at the forefront of evidence-based care. With a lineup including Stephen Porges, Janina Fisher, Ian McGilchrist, Pat Ogden, Anna Lemke, Stephen Hayes, Richard Schwartz, and 28 others, this really is a once in a lifetime learning opportunity. The best bit is it's 100% free to attend live and you can do so from the comfort of home. You'll also be able to upgrade to your recordings and certification pass after registration, although this is entirely optional. For more information, please check out the sign up link in the description. Dr. Richard Swartz, thank you so much for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to meet you. You as well, Matt, and Richard too. Yeah. I'm yeah. Glad. Yes, I'm definitely here because this is uh, uh, terrific. Uh, now, we don't want to sort of get you too uh, excited about how excited we are about you, but I am. Uh, Internal Family Systems is uh, a fabulous, uh, fabulous uh, piece of work. Uh, I'm, I'm so, uh, thank you so much for doing doing the work and bringing it to us. But it, it's it's our pet thing which is we have to first, we have to actually think in systems, but we need to understand systems. Uh, and then we need to turn around and make it practical and, and viable. And you've done all that. Uh, can you just fill us in? Let's just get a bit of the backstory of, of what led you to, to drag you out of the linear thinking uh, reductionist world and, and into this um, you know, beautiful world of systems and complexity. It depends on how far back you want me to go, but um, it really started when I was just got out of college and my father worked in a medical center and got me a job on the psych unit. Uh, and I, my job was an occupational therapist, so I would play games with the patients and take them places and, and uh, they would have pretty severe symptoms. And then I'd be in the day room when the families would visit and a lot of these were adolescent kids. And uh, I could see how dysfunctional the families were and how scapegoated they were. And then I'd hear about their sessions with their analysts and none of that was was involved. And I thought there's really something wrong with this picture. But I was just a little kid and I didn't know any better. And, but so I, but it got me interested in maybe finding some kind of uh, you know, path in the psychotherapy world. And and then I heard about family therapy some years later. It was an incipient movement. 
and uh, wound up getting a PhD in that and and got steeped in systems thinking from that because uh, the family therapists I was interested in had all studied Gregory Bateson and uh, yeah, they really embraced systems thinking and were really against what they called linear thinking, which they saw as the problem in most of psychotherapy. And uh, so, yeah, I just, systems thinking opened my eyes to all kinds of things. And so once my clients started talking about these parts, I wasn't interested in just what each part was like. I wanted to know how they all operated as a system. Yes, I think what 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 I loved in the work, and uh, most people listening to us know that Matt and I have been uh, trying to explain and and <clears throat> uh, give people knowledge and an understanding of how to think in a system way, a systemic way. Uh, and you know, it's sort of bad advertising, I suppose, with a bad uh, bad product name, you know, because complex complex systems. It sounds like it's difficult, but actually, it's it's surprisingly uh, uh, not. But the um, you know, it's just the, the 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 nature of the way we 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 shift ourselves into a um, a resistance to things that we don't know. So the first thing is to get to know what these these elements are and how we shift. And and this this difference of the parts are uh, uh, interacting. I remember Prigogine. He is my favorite quote, and he was just giving a mathematical quote, and he mm -hmm. said, "We differentiate the elements." in order to discover the richness within them, which are not evident while they are combined as the emergent property. So mm -hmm. this is what you do. You pull them apart, not to separate them, but to be able to look at them. Is that the, the process that you, you work with? Yeah, although I wouldn't say I'm pulling them apart so much as I'm having clients get to know them. Uh, and uh, hmm. you know, they're already sort of separate. And I'm just helping clients kind of put the spotlight inside and and seeing who's in there and and again not just noticing each of them individually but also noticing the relationships and the patterns among them and so yeah that that's i think my big contribution one of them yeah yeah and i think was, it's, yeah i think it's nice matt well, well, how are you well, going oh sorry it? i was just going to say and it was the it was the commonality across clients that you you managed to then formulate um sort of what these relationships were were about when we're talking um internal family systems so for those that <laughs> don't, don't don't know you that well um and so tell us a little bit about that um discovery of the commonalities and then sort of when the light bulb went on um as to what's going on here internally yeah so um as i said i was really i was a really obnoxious family therapist at the time and <laughs> I, there were lots of us and so i i really assiduously didn't study anything about intrapsychic process because that was the big polarization and uh and wanted to prove family therapy worked and so i tried to do an outcome study around 1980 with bulimia as the the topic and and uh, found family therapy didn't work with that population anyway. And uh, got frustrated and asked clients why they kept binging and purging. And they started talking this language of parts. And at first I thought, well, that's an interesting metaphor for their thoughts and emotions, because I didn't know from parts. But they were talking about them as if they were little personalities, little people inside of them. And, so first I thought they, they must be sicker than I thought. Maybe they had DID. And then I calmed down about that because I noticed I had I had them in me too. And so then I just got curious and started to uh, get, ask a lot of questions and have them ask questions of their parts. And, and, uh, and again, start noticing the patterns among these parts. Like they would... Most everyone, every one of these kids had a critic, a nasty critic, that they could identify pretty easily. And then that would bring up a part that made them feel worthless and empty. And the emptiness brought in the binge to fill it up or get them away from it. But then the critic would come back because of the binge, and that would go to the heart of the empty, worthless part. And so they were caught up in that vicious cycle. And initially, I 
thought the parts were what they seemed. And I made the mistake that most therapy does even today of fight, getting my client to fight with them or try to control them until uh, I was taught by a part that that how futile that was. And, and again, just got out of the controlling place and just started listening and learned that they weren't what they seemed, that, that they would have been forced into these extreme roles inside of my clients and that actually didn't like the role they were in. And they had their druthers, they'd do something entirely different that was always valuable. And I start, I had one client teach that to me and then I tried it on other clients and oh my God, it's, it's all the same. You know, all these parts are saying the same thing. And so that's when I got excited. And, uh, and you know, I thought, okay, maybe in these kids, that's true. But what about rapists or murderers? Or And so I started trying, trying it with the most extreme cases I could find. And uh, it held up. So my last book was called No Bad Parts because it turns out there are no bad parts. They're just good parts forced into these extreme places. And, uh, and the goal then becomes to release them from these extreme roles they've been forced into. Just like in a family that kids get forced out of their naturally helpful, valuable place to be the a role in the family. and. It isn't their nature, but it's what the dynamics of the family force them to be. Yeah, it's so interesting that, I mean, you might be interested in, in what I'm going to say now, uh, Richard, because I actually learned about all this without knowing I was learning about this in my first career. I had a sort of a career before this where I was a, an actor. Huh. And this is what we work with all the time. You know, right. where is, how, how do I rearrange me yeah. It, you know, yeah. where's the murderer within me where's the good guy within me where's yeah, the exactly. yeah and and they were always as you say they were always uh, actually there's a very famous quote from from uh, uh, a guy who always played a baddie and they said oh you must be awful playing the baddie all the time he said no no i'm not a baddie i just achieve uh, safety and looking after my family in a way that other people don't seem to like <laughs> Yeah, so so these perspectives, and that's another aspect of it. Just to segue into, is that we can get um, a, sort of a, a dysfunctional functionality. You know, we're so, we're so used to the parts being in a certain sort of order and a framework. Uh, this, how does this sort of uh, get uh, become? People become aware of the the fact that they're functioning, but it's not a functional functioning. Well, most people start with some kind of symptom or problem that brings them to us. And uh, like if I were working with you, Richard, I would say, okay, so when you say you came in because you drink too much, so tell me what happens just before you go on a drinking binge. And as you told me about it, I'd say, oh, okay, so one part of you does this and then another part does that. Is that right? Like. One part of you says, oh, let's go have a drink. And another part says, no, that's going to hurt everybody. And you have this big battle inside. And But even before that, what happened and inside? So I'm just helping people do what I call a U-turn in their focus and noticing this inner world that they're hardly aware of because their parts keep them focused in the outer world. And as they notice, I'll use that language and, you know, most everybody says, yeah, that's right. I do have a part like that. And I, if I use subpersonality or eternal object or something, they'd say, hell no, what are you talking about? But everybody can go with that parts language. So by the end of a session, we've identified four or five parts that sort of run the client's life. And I'll say, would you like to change all that? Would you like some help trying to, to rearrange things in there? And, and then we're off. Well, I think one the, the term that I find most interesting, because you, uh, you you talk about, you know, people, uh, by making these awarenesses, they, they find a sort of uh, move into a state of self-confidence, more openness, more compassion. But you describe it as, as sometimes, and quite often perhaps, uh, being almost spontaneous. 
just you set up what do you set up the circumstances what is this is this a natural movement what what do you think going is going on there yeah so this is something i just stumbled onto which is um, the centerpiece of the model now and the big contribution i think which is just beneath the surface of these parts lies this what i've come to call the self with a capital s that can be accessed spontaneously if they open space. And so, uh, if I, again, going back to you and me, and let's say I had you, let's say you wanted to work with the part of you that does drink too much. I'd have you focus on it, find it in your body. And then I'd ask this sort of magic question, how do you, Richard, feel toward that drinking part? And you might say, I hate it because I can't control it and it leads to bad things. And I'd say that totally makes sense that you would hate it. But let's see if the part who hates it could go into a waiting room or just give us a little space so you can just get curious about it and get to know it a little bit. Yeah. Or if I, even if I didn't say get curious, just ask if it'll open up a little space and relax back in there. Okay, it did. And now how do you feel toward the drinking part? I'm kind of curious about why it does this. And, and you know, I, it, I, I'm just really interested in, in what, what it wants me to know about that. So just the simple act of getting the angry one, the one who's angry at the drinking part, to open space, seemed to release this other person who was curious and calm and confident and even frequently compassionate toward the target part. And when I would ask what part of you is that, people would say, that's not a part like these others, that's me. That's myself. So I call that the self with a capital S. And it turns out now, 40 years later, and thousands of people using this all over the world as evidence from your interest, um, that self is in everybody, can't be damaged, and is just beneath the surface of the parts such that when they open space, you shift into that those C word qualities. And once you make that shift, you'd take over the session. You would just start interviewing the part in a way that that actually would learn its secret history about how it got forced into that role. And then we could give it a lot of appreciation for trying to help you rather than attack it for, for making you drink too much. And, and with that, it, we would learn about what it was protecting and we could go and heal that. And then it would be interested in a totally different job and would stop making you drink all the time. So that's that self is the key to all this. Right. And we're we're sort of uncovering an implicit schema of the part that was, like you said, in in secret or sort of covered up um, previously, but now we're we're sort of bringing it to the surface. We're making it explicit. Yeah. Yeah, again, yeah. Uh, most of us have no clue what's going on going on behind the scenes and inside of us. Yeah. Yeah, and I like the way it, it gives the, the the client, I mean, just that, that person who's come to us for help, but it's actually giving them uh, uh, activities and uh, the capacities to, to productively and uh, function outside of the therapy room, which is it's, okay. it's a, putting them in touch with the, their central resources but this idea that there is this um i i like it i've been talking about this uh in various ways myself for for, for quite a while I, I back in the acting days as well but just this sort of core element and uh, uh we, we used to talk about it in acting that when we played a character it helped us understand the self it helped us understand who we wanted to come back to mm -hmm. and you're really opening up that you're really opening up the, the it's like you're in this drama, but it's um, it's a drama you don't have to be in. And it's a drama you can direct yourself. So that you can direct yourself. Hmm. Yeah. So as, as you're saying, people do this on their own. Once they get the hang of it, it becomes a kind of life practice. And one of the big goals is for these parts to come to trust self as a leader, as a, as a director or as a good inner parent or that there is this, this level of leadership available to them that they didn't know about because they had blended with it. They covered it over. 
And as they get that, like if I was doing that work with your drinking part, I might say, Richard, ask the part how old it thinks you are. Most people get a single digit. It still thinks you're nine years old. And it still thinks it has to do what it needed to do back then to get you safe. And a lot of these parts are shocked when you tell them how old you are. And uh, so they get frozen in time during traumas often or emergencies. And they also carry what I call burdens, which are extreme beliefs and emotions that came into you during the bad time and attach to the parts and then drive them like a virus. So as, as we're getting to know parts, we're not only getting to know their relationship with each other, but we're also getting to know uh, where they're, from, they're stuck in the past and what kind of burdens they carry. Now, Matt, this is this is uh, what Richard's going to be talking about at the at the Holistic Recovery Summit. We're you know we're we're very excited about uh, this opportunity for people to to hear to hear all these different things, and you'll be talking about this more more expansively. And you're having you're having a a, a dual conversation. You're having a, oh, well a dual conversation, of course it is, <laughs> but you're having a conversation with one of your colleagues uh, on the, this this particular talk. Yeah, um, CC. Well, cease, cease, oh, cease. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be interesting. Who, yeah, who actually specializes in IFS and addictions? So, uh, the, the the drinking example was a good one. Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah. yeah. And she's she's written a few uh, training manuals as well um, in this area, which is uh, will be wonderful to find out about. Yeah, yeah. She's she's a great colleague. Yeah, well, fantastic. Well, we are looking forward to uh, to hearing uh, what you both have to say at the the Holistic Recovery Summit. And uh, Richard, I just like to thank you so much just for dropping in today and uh, saying hi and uh, just giving some of that background. It's fantastic. Yeah, well, thanks for your interest, and I look forward to seeing you guys there. Yep, that's as much fun as I thought it was going to be. That's great. <laughs> it's it's really good. He's just uh, one of those people that's been around doing this work, uh, and it was yeah. it was great to talk to him. So the Holistic Recovery Summit, go uh, go see him. Uh, now the links for that will be on uh, the, the the podcast page and on the web page, yep. and you'll find that in various things. And you might catch uh, another uh, uh, Facebook post or so about it. We're putting putting quite a bit of information out about it. So jump in and check it out. Fantastic. Well, thanks everybody for joining us here at the Science of Psychotherapy podcast and uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye for now.